This episode is brought to you by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. At WeatherGuard, we make wind turbine lightning protection easy. If you're a wind farm operator, stop settling for damaged turbine blades and constant downtime. Get your uptime back with our strike tape lightning protection system. Learn more in today's show notes or visit weatherguardwind.com slash strike tape. Welcome back. I'm Alan Hall. I'm Dan Blewett, and this is the Uptime Podcast, where we talk about wind energy, engineering, lightning protection, and ways to keep your wind turbines running. All right, welcome back to the Uptime Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett. On today's episode, we have a great guest, Nicholas Gaudern, CTO of PowerCurve is here, and we had a really fantastic conversation all about uh, wind turbine power curve upgrades, blade aerodynamics, all that good stuff. So Alan, I'll kick this off to you. What were some of your takeaways uh, from our conversation with Nick? Well, I was sh- shocked at how much performance improvement that uh, power curve can offer to existing blades that, that even have damage to them. So leading edge erosion damage, uh, hail, whatever, they can basically eliminate the the additional drag and power curve loss by the addition of uh, vortex generators, gurney flaps, um, and and bring back that power and make the the blade somewhat insensitive to a lot of the dirt and contamination and issues that happen typically on wind turbine blades. Yeah, it was a really interesting conversation. I uh, I think it really demystified a lot of the aerodynamic stuff, especially, which can get pretty complex uh, regarding, you know, airflow over wind turbine blades. And it's not a one stop fix. It's, they are tailoring the aerodynamic improvements and modifications to the site's particular uh, wind turbine manufacturer and blade style and and what may be happening on those blades at this particular moment. So it's, it's not VGs everywhere. It is selective use of the proper solution to improve those particular turbines. And they go through this comparative phase where they upgrade one turbine next to another turbine and show that the power curve increase, the AEP, has gone up and they can actually monitor that. So they're, they're, they're proving their technology on site before they implement it on a, on a larger scale on a particular site, which is the right way to do it. Show that it works, demonstrate its durability. And then when we cross that threshold, now we can do the rest of the turbines and bring our whole site up in terms of AEP. It's the, it's the right way to go about it. So without further ado, let's kick it off to our conversation with Nicholas Gaudern, CTO from PowerCurve. All right, Nick, uh, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, you're very welcome. Nice to speak to you guys. So obviously today we're going to talk a ton about power curve and blade aerodynamics and all that stuff. Um, but first I want to talk about, you know, when blades roll off the factory floor. Um, you know, obviously the aerodynamics are as good as they're ever going to be. And then after that, you know, with wear and tear and accumulation of dust and dirt and just all those things that you know happen over time, you know, the performance will begin to degrade. Um, so one of the, the lesser known things that we've chatted a little bit about with other guests on the show um, is dirt buildup. So uh, that's one of those lesser known performance killers. Can, can you shine some light on how big of a problem that is? And then also... What are some other lesser known performance uh, killers? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, this this notion of uh, the factory clean blade, the as new blade is really important because when uh, a blade is being designed, um, the aerodynamic data that's used in the process is typically from a, a wind tunnel. And it's often from a wind tunnel when you're using a, a really clean model with like a polished surface, mm-hmm. you know, you can almost see your face in these things. So as soon as you even paint the surface, uh, it's very likely that the aerofoil is going to perform like you might expect from a wind tunnel. So it's it's firstly important just to sort of think about that. But then obviously, as soon as the blade gets out in the real world, it's experienced to these, you know, ever-changing environmental conditions, dirt, bugs, ice, erosion. They're all going to play a role in performance. So... When we talk about dirt, I think it's it's good to sort of take this broader picture almost. So, you know, not, not just dirt, but erosion, ice, all these other things we just mentioned. 
And what, what's actually happening um, aerodynamically is when you get a, a contamination on the surface or an erosion, they act in quite similar ways. It's adding roughness to the surface, of course. Uh, but what does that roughness do? Well, when we have uh, an airflow over a surface, um, the bit that's very close to the surface, close to the wall, is called the boundary layer. And that's the area of flow where the velocity is, is zero, right at the surface, and then it increases up to the free stream. Now, what happens to that boundary layer is critical to determining what the airflow performs like. So as soon as you put any obstacles in the flow, that's going to affect how that boundary layer behaves, mm -hmm. how it grows, how it evolves over the airflow. So when we put that dirt in, um, we're impacting the boundary layer, you know, the health of the boundary layer, and therefore the, the level of performance we're going to get. So what we typically see in, in simple terms is we see a loss of lift, which is bad because lift is what's creating our, our torque force that's, that's giving us the power, but also we're increasing drag. So we're pulling on the rotor, basically, we're reducing the power it can produce. Mm. So loss of lift, increase in drag, they're both occurring due to dirt. And depending on where they occur on the blade, they'll affect the performance in different ways. But typically, erosion and contamination tends to be worse at the tip because that's where our local flow speeds are highest. So yeah. bugs stick more, erosion happens more quickly. So it's a big ripple effect is what it sounds like? Just like a little bit of contamination yeah, at the yeah. surface is going to affect the boundary layer and then everything beyond it. Yeah, basically it, it affects all of the flow downstream of where that contamination is occurring. And what we can do is we can actually model that. So we can say, well, if my aerofoil had performance X and it's now got performance Y, what is the AP? And typically what we see in the field is... Even on a pretty clean blade, you might lose a few tenths of a percent AP just from light uh, surface roughness, things like mm -hmm. that. But you might lose up to, say, 3 or 4% AP due to, due to contamination. But I would say that's at the upper end for a modern turbine. I would say that's quite rare. Typically, you're going to be in the you know up to 2% range, I would say, is, is, is pretty common. Gotcha. Uh, for what you might be losing. Could you, uh, could you while we while we have you uh, on this aerodynamic path, could you dive a little deeper into airflow separation and and maybe just give uh, for people, including myself, who don't have a background in aerodynamics, you know, so what the basics are as far as airflow and what they might need to know. The concept of stall is really critical to uh, to a blade design because stall. Uh, in in again in sort of basic terms, it, it's it's bad because you lose lift, you increase drag, you increase noise. It's basically this danger zone mm -hmm. for airflow performance. So you know, really, you want the the boundary layer to be nicely attached to the surface as it as it traverses over the cord. One definition of stall is when that boundary layer is starting to separate from the trailing edge, and that's typically where we see this this separation start on the wind turbine at the trailing edge. So that boundary layer will start basically peeling away from the surface, from the trailing edge as we come towards the leading edge. And the more it separates, the more it's peeling off the surface, the more lift you'll lose, the more drag you'll increase, and the more noise you'll get. So if you think of a curve uh, of lift versus the flow angle of an aerofoil, as we increase the flow angle, the lift's going to go up pretty linearly and then we'll reach a peak mm. and it'll drop off the peak. And that, that peak and dropping over the other side, that's what we call stall, typically. So do you want to get as close as possible to that then? Or is there, uh, you know... You want to be you want to be like a safe distance away. Uh, and, and people's definition of safe can be quite different. But I would say a good rule of thumb is like two or three degrees angle of attack of that, that inflow angle coming into the blade. So... That means that when you get a gust, you get a, a sudden change in flow direction due to this, this turbulent wind field that we're experiencing out in the real world. That means you're unlikely to, to go over that stall point too much. Gotcha. So it's, it's the kind of this rule of thumb and you want to stay away from stall. So it's like that little margin for error, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, basically. It's, a, it's, a, it's an aerodynamic safety margin. You can think about it like that. So the designer has two goals in mind when they're, they're configuring their blade shape. It's getting peak efficiency of the airfoil, so a peak lift to drag ratio, and having a sensible stall margin. The problem is that some airfoils might have their peak efficiency really close to stall, and then you say, well, what do I do? Do, yeah. do I risk it? <laughs> 
or do I drop back and actually stay safe but accept that I'm not going to get the peak efficiency that that aerofoil could deliver? So it sounds then like the the big battle in you know the wind power industry is that a they want to figure out where the 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 best uh, you know how close they can get to the stall margin without being too risky, and uh, obviously then they're going to have to fight all the contaminants that would maybe build up on the blade over time and yeah. the erosion. And I mean, is that a pretty decent summary of the the kind of the battle that's waged for keeping your power curve up? It, it is, yeah, and it it does link really nicely back to the this sort of clean airfoil discussion. Um, and I think it's really important to say that an aerofoil performance curve, let's say this lift versus angle of attack curve, it, it's a living, breathing thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's never the same from almost one day to the next because it depends so heavily on the surface condition. So our stall point, let's say it's at 10 degrees angle of attack when the blade is new. When that blade is dirty, the aerofoil may stall at 7 degrees angle of attack. So that stall point has moved inwards because the boundary layer health has suffered so much due to this, this contaminant, this erosion. So yeah, it's this battle of understanding where stall is, trying to keep away from it, and then thinking about how you can mitigate against that problem. Nick, what other, other effects happen with blade tip stall? Because the, the blade has a slight twist to it, correct? So the, the whole blade yeah. is not at the same angle of attack and the, the more aggressive angle of attack, so to speak, would be out of the tip where you're trying to generate most of your power. So if the blade goes into stall out of the tip, what other what happens to the blade? Does it twist? Does it start to flutter? What what effects does that have? Typically, you know, unless there's something really catastrophic going on aerodynamically, you will just see uh, a loss of power. Mm. Um, that be the, that'll be the first thing you see, and it'll typically be sort of at what we call the knee of the power curve. You know, just before you get up to rated, because that's where the angle of attacks are highest. Right. Typically, just before rated, so that's where you start to see the power loss. If the aerofoils are of a certain design that means they have quite an aggressive stall. Like the, the lift difference as they pass over the peak is quite steep. Mm -hmm. You might start to get like increased uh, fatigue loading on the blade right. as you travel back and forward over that, that stall point. So you're in stall, out of stall, is, is that what the condition is? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we're in this turbulent wind field, which uh, is really horrible, you know, analytically because trying to trying to understand this flow field is is nigh impossible. So you can never think of, yeah, you've got the static target. It's always a moving target, mm -hmm. you know, you're working with on the inflow angle, the, the flow speed, all this kind of thing. So yeah, power loss from stall, noise increase, possibly some fatigue load increase. And typically it will progress from from the tip inboard, you know, as, as a rule. So as an operator, can I tell just by walking around where I have issues with angle of attack and and maybe my blade tips install. Can I hear that on the ground? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> I think, you know, that there are people who are very familiar with the way turbines sound. You know, some of the technicians who are out there with them every day and they they may well be able to pick up uh, some stall noise, particularly mm -hmm. if it's if it's, you know, quite severe. Sure. But to the uncalibrated ear, <laughs> you know, it may be a little bit difficult. So Probably the first thing you would look at is your is your SCADA data mm -hmm. and trying to, to hunt down, can I see at a certain time of year, maybe when there's a lot of dirt, can I see like a degradation in the power curve, particularly around the, the knee area? So, but it's hard, you know, it's really hard because we're looking at small uh, small losses. You know, let's say sure. it's, it's a 1% AP loss. Well, unless you've got a really solid baseline data set, trying to track that could, could be quite hard. Do operators have that baseline data set when the blades are new? Do they track that over time? I would say it's not very common. I'd say it's not very common. Some operators are really on it when it comes to SCADA. You know, they've got great machine learning, AI techniques, all this kind of stuff they're employing. But I would say that's, that's not the majority uh, at all. So unless you're tracking all these metrics really carefully from day one, yeah, it might be quite difficult to, to find a loss of, of that magnitude. So the operators mm. may not even know they're losing that uh, percentage yeah. point or two. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's the issue. Yeah, you may have these turbines running and, you know, they look all right to the naked eye. You, you can't really see anything obvious in the power curve that you're comfortable, you know, right. putting a bet on. So almost it's a bit invisible. So so 
what we try to do uh, at Power Curve is we talk about like an inverse proof. Well, let's say you've got a blade out there. You don't believe anything's wrong with it. Okay, fine. Well, let's test the opposite hypothesis. Let's assume there is something wrong with it based on our aerodynamic understanding. Let's apply a, a fix, so to say, something like a, a vortex generator. And now let's use a really precise method of SCADA analysis to determine whether performance improves the, you know, in the months after we install the upgrade. And if we see an upgrade uh, of AP, an increase, mm -hmm. well, then we've proved there was a problem to begin with. You know, so it may be very hard to determine whether you had a problem to, to start with, but yeah, take this inverse proof method, apply a fix. Do I get a performance gain? Well, then you've sort of answered your, your question, really. Yeah, it's a really good way to go about it. What, what SCADA improvements do you make to track that? So we typically use a method called the side-by-side -side method. Um, it's pretty common in the industry. A lot of the OEMs use it and, and some of the independent um, validation houses like uh, Deutsche Wingard, for example. So, so what you do is you take two turbines um, that are next to each other, very close to each other, and you make sure that you've got like six to 12 months of data where those turbines haven't been touched. You know, they haven't had a control change or maintenance operation. So you work out how those perform, perform uh, relative to each other. So you get a delta performance, basically. You then upgrade one of the turbines with your, with your aerodynamic kit. And then you'll just continue measuring as you always would with the SCADA. And then, you know, six to 12 months after that, you then say, well, what's my new delta performance between these turbines? So I've got delta after the installation. I subtract delta before the installation and I'm left with what's the change? And if there's a positive change there, well, you know, great. We found some performance. And the nice thing about the side-by-side -side method is that it basically eliminates the uncertainty of your wind measurement right. because you don't use it. You're just using the power signal. And it's the wind speed measurement that's the thing that has huge uncertainty associated with it with, with other techniques, even with an atmosphere. It's, sure. it's not great. Hmm. Sure. So you can do you can do this experiment then without any modifications to the control system or anything about the turbine. Correct. Yep. You just let them run for a couple of months. Yeah, yeah. You know, you just keep measuring the SCADA data as, as you normally would and yeah, then just do do your analysis. It's all just about the, the mathematical process used to to analyze that data set and yeah, we have a really nice method at, at Power Curve. We've, we've worked with um, the Deutsche Wingard on actually, who are really experienced in that field. And we, we get really good customer acceptance of that method. Oh, sure. Um, they're, they're, they're happy with that that kind of comparison because it's something they're familiar doing themselves. Right. They, they can monitor themselves. They don't need a third party to be involved in that. So. No, no, exactly. I mean, sometimes they do just because it's always nice to have a, you know another pair of eyes on the problem. But sure. Most operators, you know, uh, can do that analysis themselves. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So the the upgrades that would happen to the blade if if you come onto a site and it say it's been out there four or five six years and you know it's in a and the blades are in a rough condition. Some of them you can just see from the ground. What are the yeah. what are the things in your toolbox to get the AEP back up to where it should be? Yeah, it's a great question and. Um, I would say that the primary tool we have is uh, is vortex generators. So if we sort of think back to this discussion about the boundary layer and the fact that erosion and contamination is, mm -hmm. is damaging the health of the boundary layer and therefore we're losing performance. Well, what a vortex generator does, and the clue is in the name, it generates a vortex, but, but why is that important? So when you put a VG on the surface, what it's doing, if you put it in the right place, is it's generating this... Uh, vortex pair. And what that does is that draws down or entrains this higher energy flow from outside the boundary layer, basically sort of sucks it down to the surface. So what we're doing is we're, we're re-energizing the boundary layer. Mm -hmm. We're going to increase its health. And what that means is instead of getting this trailing edge separation that might have been creeping in because the boundary layer is getting a bit old and tired by the time it's reached the trailing edge, the VG's re-energized it and it means it can stay fully attached all the way to the trailing edge. Mm. So if we restore this this flow attachment, we get our lift back that we lost. And we might recover a little bit of drag, depending on how severe the store was, but it, it's the lift recovery that's the really key thing um, that the VG can enable. So what we do at Power Curve is 
when we go to a site that, that we've been invited to assess, we'll look at the blade condition, particularly on the leading edge. And if, if there are drone inspection uh, photographs available, that's perfect because they're really high resolution, close to the leading edge. We can actually make an assessment of how that erosion is affecting performance. So we can run an aerodynamic simulation, like a, a computational fluid dynamic simulation. So once we know how bad the problem is, we can then basically prescribe the cure. So that will typically be a vortex generator array, but it will be in a particular location, both cord-wise and span-wise, to address the specific level of contamination uh, severity that a turbine has. Most of the time, they're all pretty much in the same place. Mm -hmm. However, a nice case study we had recently was a wind turbine that was so severely contaminated, a two, two megawatt turbine, it wouldn't even reach like 1.5 megawatts. Mm, whoa. So, you know, catastrophic aerodynamic issue. And there, you know, we had to be a, a bit more aggressive in, in how we, we fix the problem. But Yeah, I mean, that's going to affect the whole output of the wind farm. I mean, if they're 1.5 yeah. when they're expecting 2.5, I mean, that's a... Is that a 40% 40, 40% yeah. drop? I mean, that's huge. It's, it, it's a huge issue. And this is why, you know, I mean, that's, that's like the most extreme case I've ever seen mm -hmm. by some margin, but it just goes to show that it can happen. And, you know, when you go and do your blade inspection for structural damage, it's super important to start thinking about the aerodynamics as well, because it, you know. When you guys install these these kits, do you, is there a really thorough cleaning process that goes along with it? I mean, how do you prep? Because uh, I do want to get into the the three main ones, obviously vortex generators, and you guys also use uh, gurney flaps and and trailing yep, edge serrations right. a bunch. So can you tell us about the process of getting their their kit sort of installed on the on the blades? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I mean, it's it's a fairly straightforward process compared to a lot of uh, work that might go on on a turbine. Mm -hmm. So what we do is um, it's typically installed by a rope access crew. Um, but you know you could use a man basket or a cherry picker or something. But typically a rope crew. So the first step would be to go and mark up the blade. Um, so to mark the the installation line of where you're going to put your kit, and and that will come from the, from a manual that, that we provide. So typically it's pretty low tech. You almost use like a chalk line, just sort of snap it on the blade and and get some kind of marking. Then what you'll do is you'll you'll clean the surface um, with just some light sandpaper, grip paper, just to abrade away any any serious dirt and just, just roughen the surface a bit so it's more suitable for bonding. Wipe it down with some, some isopropyl alcohol or, or similar cleaner. And then basically you're good to go. So um, Power Curve only uses a wet structural adhesive to apply VGs because in our experience, the alternative, which might just be a self-adhesive tape, is simply not a robust enough solution. We hear a lot of complaints about add-ons that have been put on the tape only falling yeah. or not being sure. so robust. So, yeah. and the fact we use this wet adhesive means that you know you can be fairly uh, flexible, let's say, you know, in in the surface quality you're bonding to because it's. It's, it's just basically indestructible. Once that glue's there, it's, it's not going anywhere. And so how do you get your models of, because you obviously do a lot of modeling and, and to determine where, you know, they're losing power. What does that modeling process look like? I mean, that's what we spend a lot of our time on. And um, there's a lot of complex aerodynamics going on, as, as you can mm -hmm. imagine. So the first step is to actually obtain the blade geometry to make sure that we can analyze uh, the specific model of turbine of blade that, that we're looking at. So we do that with a laser scanning process. Um, typically we do that with a blade on the ground because that's a bit easier, but we can do it when the blade's on the tower. It just means you have to have a very still day so the blade's not moving around all over the place. Sure. But we then get a, a really fast laser scanner, scan the entire blade surface, get a point cloud, and then we reverse engineer out a solid CAD surface uh, from that point cloud. So that basically forms the basis of, of all the subsequent steps. And that's got to be really precise, right? I mean, if it's going to capture that yep. that fine buildup, because we're not talking about like six inches of caked, you know, dirt on most oh, yeah, of the blades. Oh, yeah, maybe so. just to clarify, yeah, we're, we're just after the blade shape. Oh, okay. At, at this stage, yeah. So just the blade shape to do the analysis. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll use inspection photographs, yeah, preferably from a drone, 
trying to look at how about the contamination is. Gotcha. So it's sort of this this hybrid uh, approach. You're actually picking up the real blade surface, not the theoretical blade surface that would come out of the OEM. You actually have a real blade surface. Yeah, uh, and I think that's really important. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether you've been in a blade factory, but um, when the blades come out of the mold, there's quite a lot of... Um, I don't know, how should we say, craftsmanship yes. <laughs> goes into finishing the blade, you know, like, you know, grinding the leading edge, finishing the trailing mm -hmm. edge. So even though it's a molded product, there are differences. So actually having the real laser scan is quite helpful, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, we just use that to feed the CFD, mm -hmm. basically, and there are the error calculations. And then your VG installation does not modify the blade structure at all. If you're applying the VG with an adhesive, essentially... There's no need to review any structural structural aspects. This is just an add-on, no. glued to the surface type of system. It's really simple to put on, and no, it, it doesn't affect the structure. I mean, they're, they're plastic components. Mm -hmm. they're, they're very small. You know, you pick them up in, in your hand. So the entire kit is only adding a few kilos of mass to the blade. And because they're plastic, thin plastic components, they're very compliant. So they're just going to move with the blade. You know, they're not they're not going to be applying any load. They're not attracting uh, any stress. So, the, yeah, completely benign structurally. Um, the technicians needed to install it. Do they require any additional level of training before they would install these parts? From a product specific point of view, we give some training okay. because even though the techs uh, may well be familiar with vortex generators. Like I said, because we use a wet adhesive, you know, perhaps we want the adhesive put on in a different pattern to another OEM, you know, provider or something. So we typically give a, a training course just a few hours, just take them through our installation manual, show them some demo parts. Oh, okay. So in terms of like the, the you know, the getting up on the blade, how to put stuff on, we'll know that the techs are all experts at doing that. It's just sure. the product specifics, you know, we want to make sure they understand. Wow. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. And so you, you touched on something, uh, you said they only add a, a couple kilos to the total blade surface. Um, and that would be a really big problem if there was a ton in, you know, of, of weight. So are, have there been, uh, cause I've heard stories that maybe some other companies have these really heavy aerodynamic add-ons that can maybe change the blade in a really negative way long-term. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> I mean, it's something that, yeah, you do have to be careful because obviously that blade's had a lot of attention paid to it structurally. Mm -hmm. um, so if you start doing something drastic, you've got to watch out. And, and there was uh, some cases of uh, very large spoilers. Um, so kind of thing like you might see on the back of your car, I guess, like a big sort of flick um, being installed in the root region of the blade uh, to boost lift. And we'll, we'll maybe come back to that in a, in a few minutes. But those parts were so big and stiff that they are actually introducing some some local cracking mm. in the blade, but I mean they're like canoes, more bigger than canoes. These really massive components, so they they attract a lot of load, and, and you you don't want to attract load. You just want to stay small, light, compliant. So that's why you know the add-ons that that Powerco provides are yeah of that form. You know we just we don't want anything structural. We don't want to, don't want to touch. Yeah, it. absolutely. Your VGs are slightly different in terms of shape and size than other VGs we've seen on the marketplace. What makes your VGs a little bit, little more unique? Yeah, I mean, I think the key, the key thing is is actually where you put them. Um, that that's going to really drive um, how well they perform and therefore how much energy they're going to recover from things like contamination and erosion. So. Typically, if you go out into, into a wind farm, you may see vortex generators down in the root region, let's say like the inner one third of the blade. That's pretty common. A lot of the OEMs put them on in the factory. What you don't see very often is vortex generators that extend any further uh, out along the blade than, than that. So that's a really key thing about what Power Curve do. We, we focus on the outer part of the blade because that's where all the money's made. You know, that's where all the energy is being created. Like the outer 50% uh, of the blade might be producing 70 plus percent of the energy. So that's where you should spend your, your time and your money. So if you have erosion and contamination, it's going to be affecting the outboard part. So therefore we focus our products on 
mitigating this performance loss that you're going to see yeah, more in the outer parts of the blade. So, so that's a key difference. Um, and also we, we put our V port extremities typically in a different cord wise position to, to some of our competitors. And I would say that's probably down to the fact we've done a lot of wind tunnel testing and simulation. So we've actually been able to maybe understand and optimize the product a little bit more than, than some other side. I won't say everyone because, you know, there are, there are some great, great products from the OEMs out sure. there, but I think we've, We've got a really good handle on it. I don't think there's many people know more about VGs than we do. And those VGs being on the outer half, outer third of the blade can fix a lot of other issues with the blade. Can you, you want to describe what VGs can do in terms of just recovery of of uh, leading edge erosion damage? You know, how, how, do v, can you put VGs on a blade and not necessarily fix the leading edge erosion issues just leave it yeah um yeah you can i mean i'm never going to advocate you just sort of uh put it on and forget mm -hmm. <laughs> because you know the vgs won't stop erosion happening so you can leave the leading edge as long as it's not a structural issue and to be honest most leading edge erosion isn't a structural issue right you know you've, you've eroded a millimeter of top coat the problem is that that's causing aerodynamic uh loss you know this kind of one two three percent we were talking about earlier so if you put the vgs on they'll recover a chunk of that loss and then yeah fine just leave the leading edge you know don't worry about fixing it but you know like with any big component keep doing your regular inspections because if you start finding that erosion is, is starting to, to get a hole in the structure or put a crack in well yeah of course you've got to fix it sure. but then you just have so much more flexibility because you're not just going up every you know one year to try to fix a few pinholes because it doesn't matter anymore. The VGs are looking after the flow. Right. So essentially, you have a very low cost aerodynamic fix or upgrade to compensate for a much more costly long term repair that what may or may not eventually happen depending on the edge of the blades. Yeah. Exactly. You know, there's. But one way to think about it is the fact that the VGs are just making your performance more robust. So they're going to recover losses when they occur, uh, and they're always going to be there doing that. So if you have a particularly you know, uh, dirt-filled or bug-filled summer period, we don't really need to do anything different because the VGs will just recover even more energy. Um, so it, it is this sort of nice, constant way of, of keeping your power level high. Whereas without VGs, like I said, dirt, bugs, ice, all these things that can be quite seasonal, they're going to affect your power curve. You know, you're going to get this season seasonal variation in your power curve. So you can imagine with a VG, you're going to sort of basically reduce the magnitude of that that fluctuation, push your average power level up over the year. So essentially, at that point, your your buffer, your angle of attack buffer, stall buffer, just gets greatly widened. Right, so you're just kind yeah, of wiping yeah, away yeah, that exactly. sensitivity. You're taking away the sensitivity that that the OEM has sort of designed into the blade. You're erasing a large, or just expanding that that buffer zone, which is magnificent. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, if we yeah, if we go back to that stall margin parameter, uh, a vortex generator will typically increase the stall margin by three degrees. You know, that would be a good a good rule of thumb. Wow. So suddenly you've got all this extra margin to play with, where your performance isn't going to suffer because you're falling off the top of the right, lift curve, right, basically. Right. Huh. Hmm. So let's let's shift here to uh, the other two upgrades, so gurney flaps and trailing edge serration. So how are they different from vortex generators, and, and where do they find their unique uh, sort of application within this whole ecosystem of uh, PCUs? Yeah, actually, I think I might start using the term ecosystem myself. That's, <laughs> that's really nice. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, we, we think about, yeah, this ecosystem, this, this menu of products that we can apply to fix different areas uh, of the blade. So we've talked about VGs being used for energy recovery, um, but they can also be used to actually just uh, fix poor fundamental performance. And that often happens in the root region of the blade where these thick aerofoils, which are required for, for the structure, they're horrible aerodynamically. You know, cylinders are pretty... Yeah, unslippery, you know, so there's a lot of drag, a lot of stall. So we can put VGs down in the root to help fix that. And that's another area where we can apply uh, gurney flaps. So what a gurney flap is, you can think of it as like an L shape. 
uh, typically. So it um, might be called a spoiler sometimes. And the gurney flap sits on the trailing edge of the blade. And typically like the inner one third of the span. So down in this root region where we have the thick air of foils that, that are really struggling for performance because they're just pretty, pretty fat basically. So what the gurney flap does is it boosts uh, the lift that that local section produces for the same inflow. So let's say without the gurney, we get um, a lift coefficient of, of one. Or we put a gurney flap on, maybe we'll get a lift coefficient of 1.2, so like a 20% lift boost. Um, but yeah, they're focused in the root region and they're not dependent on the surface condition. The gurney flap will boost lift no matter whether the surface is, is clean or dirty or whatever. So, so yeah, I like to split the blade up into like root region and, and, and outboard mm -hmm. region. So, root region, gurney flaps, and vortex generators uh, to help with these really thick aerofoils and they're not surface condition dependent so they'll always work outboard part of the blade aerofoils are much thinner much better aerodynamically but they suffer from contamination and erosions that's where our flow speeds are highest so erosions worse dirt depositions worse so the vgs are there uh, for recovery so recovery outboard boosting baseline inboard mm. And, and then the serrations, um, that's like the third main product that, that Power Curve offers. Um, therefore, noise reduction primarily. So when when a turbine is, is operating, you'll hear that swooshing right. sound uh, as the blades travel through mm -hmm. there. That's, that's an aerodynamic noise that's coming from the boundary layer, um, interacting with the trailing edge of the wind turbine. So... This boundary layer is, is hitting the trailing edge. These pressure waves are hitting the trailing edge. They're being scattered. They're emitting sound. So what a serration does, you can imagine it just like a, a sawtooth. Um, when you put these serrations on the trailing edge of a wind turbine, what they're doing is they're altering all the scattering mechanism of, of how that noise is, is being distributed. So if we change that scattering mechanism, what we're able to do is, is reduce the overall sound power level of, of the turbine. So we basically reduce the coherence of, um, of the sound. So the noise goes with the fifth power of local velocity. So right. you know, it's hugely dependent on the flow speed. Right. So serrations are like the outer one third of the blade, 20 to 30% of the blade, something like that. Because in board of that, yeah, a serration will still work. But its contribution to the overall turbine noise is, is just so much smaller because of this fifth power relationship we have going on. So, so yeah, serrations, we, we stick it gotcha. up to the tip. And so then the main relationship between serrations and, and AEP is that when they're quieter, they can run them faster? Is that, is that Yeah, I mean, basically when, when you have a turbine um, that doesn't meet a local noise regulation, and in my experience, this is... Typically more of a, say, European problem. Most of the times the, the regulations tend to be a little bit different. But yeah, the turbine doesn't meet the local requirement. So that's the scenario. What the operator will then do is probably at certain times of uh, the day or night, they'll actually derate the turbine. So it's producing yeah. less energy, but also producing uh, less sound. So you might think, okay, great, problem solved. The problem is that that might be costing you several percent AEP you know, three, four, five percent AP maybe, because you're not solving the problem. <laughs> you know, right. you're basically just turning the turbine down when you want less noise. Um, so so what serration yeah. is doing is it's addressing the root cause of the problem, which is this this acoustic scattering at the trailing edge. So put serration on, don't have to derate your turbine anymore, you get an AP boost. And so I guess they don't probably uh, get applied to blades that are in really remote areas. Is it only ones that are more local and around residences? Yeah, exactly or not. I mean, yeah. the serrations, whilst designed for noise reduction, have like a secondary function if required. So if you imagine this thing sticking off the trailing edge of the airfoil, if you bend it slightly, then it acts like uh, one of the flaps you'll see on, on an aircraft right. as you're taking off. So you increase uh, the camber at the trailing edge, you get more lift. The big question is, do you want more lift? <laughs> so depending on how that blade was designed to begin with, how optimal it is, et cetera, et cetera, 
you may find that adding lift does next to nothing, or in the worst case, makes the performance worse. Lose it. Oh, sure. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, serrations do have this this sort of almost yeah this this functionality to boost lift, but then whether that gives you more performance is, is a much more subtle. Uh, discussion, you know, you have to do a deep dive on the aerodynamic behavior of the blade. Is that something that you model the serrations? Yeah, exactly. And and we we done quite a lot of wind tunnel testing on serrations um, because you know that's the industry standard way to validate this kind of product. But we can also use uh, the CFD, the computational fluid dynamics. So we validated our CFD model with the wind tunnel, so we're confident they they give uh, the same result. And that means we could take any new blade run it through our CFD and be confident that we understand how it's going to change the load or, or not, if, if that's the Right. Thing. So I know there's one other main uh, upgrade that maybe is, is falling out of favor. Or is, I'm sure there's a little more controversial whether or not it works. And well, I guess there's two. One are blade tip extensions, mm -hmm. you know, chopping off the tip of the blade and making it longer, and then also winglets. Yeah. Um, but like I said, it, Al and I have talked about this on the show and it seems like the jury's still out, that they're a little questionable. There's just so many potential trade-offs essentially lengthening uh, the blade. Uh, where, where do you fall in that debate just generally? Yeah, I mean, I think if we take the tip extensions first, um, aerodynamically, they're fairly straightforward to understand because effectively it's a bigger rotor and a bigger rotor means more power and it's a pretty straightforward relationship you know it's the, you know, the the square of your area plus or minus some some correction factors so there's no doubt they'll add AEP the big question is do you want to chop off the tip of your blade and bond on this new structure are you confident that the inboard structure can take uh, the additional bending moments they're going to be generated by by putting that tip extension on and that's ignoring all the permitting things. You know, a lot of wind farms, there's a, there's a specified tip height, so you can't actually go above. So mm -hmm. so that sort of maybe says, well, maybe that pushes me towards a winglet because I've then maybe got the opportunity to flick the blade. I would stay with any, within any permit regulations and a, and a winglet effectively acts quite similar to a, to a blade extension. So the winglet has some advantages in terms of you can have a – a smaller thing than, than a tip extension, so it's, it's not adding rotor area. The problem is that the, yeah, again, you know, the jury's still out and is it a good trade-off between AEP and loads and structural modification? So I would say you will get more AEP from a, from a wing or from a, from a tip extension, but do you want to chop off the tip? Uh, is the, is the structural performance of the original blade known enough that you're confident changing it, you know, quite so dramatically. So I think small things like within half a meter, one meter, the risk is is pretty low and, and you'll get some AP. If you're going much bigger than that, again, you know, we were talking earlier about this like canoe spoiler that was applied in the route. You've got to be really sure you're not going to start cracking the blade and damaging the blade because then it doesn't matter whether you've got 2% AP because if you've got to take your blade down, that's right. you know, any <laughs> yeah. benefit wiped out. Yeah. Well, I, I think that segues well into our, our next topic, which is, you know, there's a lot of uh, ideas and new, and this is, you know, Alan's talked about this on the aircraft side, that there's lots of like, hey, this is going to make sense. Let's install this on our whole, you know, fleet of planes or our whole wind site. And then a couple of years down the road, they figured, eh, you know, that wasn't, that didn't really mm -hmm. pan out in, in practice as well as it did maybe in the, in the wind tunnel or something. But um, with, you know, you guys studying and, and improving so many blades, what are some of the things you've learned along the way as a, as a company and, a, you know, and, and industry-wide, I, I would say as a whole, how, is, how have things changed have you, as you've learned more over the last five, 10 years? I think, you know, one of the key things in terms of aerodynamic performance is, the, the understanding and appreciation of, of this contamination. I think that's come on a lot in, in recent years. So when we were back using store regulated turbines, it was pretty clear that they suffered really badly when the blades were dirty. Uh, and, and you could see it super clearly in, in the power curves and the SCADA data. When we started going to these modern pitch regulated machines, um, it becomes less obvious. I say it's just harder to find 
one two percent losses in the data. But I think with a lot of work by a lot of research institutions, such as you know the Danish Technical University, there's a lot more just acceptance that that dirt does cause a measurable performance loss. So I think when people start accepting it, there's then a lot more focus on on what you do to solve it. So you know things like the vortex generators, you know, are, are coming up in conversation a, a lot more. And you know, for me personally, you know, I've, I've been in the industry around 11 years now. I guess I've just been quite surprised at how slow the uptake has been on some of these aerodynamic upgrades. So in some ways, you know, we're talking about, you know, what have I learned? In, in a way, it's like I've learned that things maybe aren't moving as fast as they should, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. Because if, if it's this accepted, understood problem, well, well, why aren't people doing more to fix it? And I know there's going to be all kinds of financial and, and commercial decisions behind it. But if I take it just from an engineering perspective, uh, dirt makes the flow bad. You can make the flow better. So so why wouldn't you? You know, There's, there's a lot of money in 1% yeah. AEP. Oh, sure there is. Yeah. Well, it seems like those are tough challenges in all industries where you have to convince yeah. people that they need a service that is going to make sense financially in the long run, but has maybe an initial upfront investment. And I think, you know, if we're talking about changes in, in the last five years, like, you know, how, how things progressed, the computational cost of big CFD simulations, big structural simulations, that's absolutely plummeted. So now, you know, even a small company like PowerCurve, we can run full blade CFD simulations in a couple of hours because we use a cloud computing service you know, we can access a thousand mm. cores of computing power for very little money. So that's enabled us to really take this this super detailed analysis approach on these problems. So as an engineer, it's just wonderful because, you know, having that kind of CPU power just unlocks this sort of wonderland of, of kind of simulations you can carry out. And and that's something else, yeah, particularly in the last five years has, has made a huge difference to to um, to aerodynamic analysis. Gotcha. Well, could you uh, could you sort of walk us through? Like, imagine you know you're sitting down with myself and Alan, and we're on board. Can you walk us through the the sort of start to finish process of you know getting a, a power curve kit installed? For sure. I mean, I think step one, it's always this this really open, transparent discussion with the customer. It's about educating first and foremost. Why why do you have a problem? And, and what are the mechanisms behind it, and then what's appropriate for a fix. I, I think a big problem in the industry as a whole is that it's, it can be quite closed sometimes. Like OEMs can be pretty reluctant to to talk about some of this stuff. Um, so we like to to educate. You know, we like to to say why you've got a problem, so we can show wind tunnel results, CFD. First of all, convince you that what we're doing is is sensible and, and we're being you know professional about it. What we'll then do, we'll take any SCADA data from your turbine if you have it, and we'll look for these very small reductions. And sometimes we find them, sometimes we don't. It depends on the quality of the SCADA data and how much you've got. What we'll then do, take any blade inspection data. Like I said, if it's from a drone, uh, that's absolutely perfect. And we'll look at you know an overview of the entire blade and how damaged it is or contaminated it is. We'll then do like a very initial assessment to say, is it worth taking this to the next level of analysis? And most of the time it is. So at that point, we'll get the blade geometry from the laser scan, if we don't have it already. We'll run the CFD simulations, we'll correlate to our wind tunnel data sets. And we have these really wonderful in-house tools we developed with the, with the Danish Tech University to actually then estimate what is the performance loss of the turbine as a result of what we see from the photographs. And then what we do is we can produce a report, show the customer and say, here's, here's your problem, here's your potential loss. This is the menu of upgrades that we have available and the expected performance increase. And what we typically find uh, is we can add between two and 4% AEP, depending on the turbine and what age it is, what condition it is, et cetera. So that's, that's the kind of offering we have to the customer. So we make sure we we go through the business case with them. 
usually it's pretty attractive because, you know, a couple of percent AP is, is a lot of money. And then what we'll do is we'll produce an installation manual, we'll engage a local installation company, and then give them the necessary training we talked about earlier. They'll go and install the kits on the turbine. We'll do a trial period, typically, because often the customer will want their own data set to validate things are working. That goes fine. We then go to the, to the roll-out phase. So all in all, you're probably looking at sort of a 12 to 18 month process from first engagement through to doing the analysis, uh, getting the trial, getting the trial data, validating it, and, and then and then doing the rollout. So what's the return on investment for that approach? Like when can they recoup their the money for all the, the time and the I would say the average is about three years. Um, that's really good on, on our product, you know, at, at an upper end. So it's clearly very dependent on local power price, but yeah, around the sort of two, three year mark is, is what we commonly see. And that means on most turbines we look at, which most of the ones we've upgraded so far are sort of seven to 10 years old as, as a starting point. You've then got another maybe 10 years of lifetime where it's free money, you know? Sure. So customers tend, tend to, tend to be pretty pleased with, with the offer. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Is there any maintenance? I mean, do they collect dust or dirt? Or I mean, is there like, what do they have to do, you know, for the duration that they're on their blade? I mean, in uh, in principle, nothing. So the components are are manufactured and, and designed to last a full uh, lifetime of a turbine. So they're made from very environmentally uh, resistant uh, plastic. So there's no issues with UV degradation, things like that. So, and as I said, because we use a wet adhesive, that bond is a, is a lifetime bond as well. It doesn't need surfacing. What you sometimes see is in places with some extreme weather events, like you know, really bad hailstorms or super heavy ice icing of the turbines. Some of the VG fins uh, might get damaged. So, as part of your main blade inspection routine, you should check if. If there's any significant damage due to these extreme weather events, but typically we, we don't see a lot. Um, but yeah, but like with any component, if you hit it with a you know a golf ball sized hailstone or you, you zap it a few times, it's, it's not sledgehammer resistant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Uh, and so, Nick, you, you've you've mentioned, you know, with, uh, you know, getting your analysis and laser scanning, I, you've mentioned that drones make your life a lot easier doing that, which obviously makes a ton of sense. Sending people up on ropes on these huge machines is yeah. such a such a much bigger hassle. Like, well, let's let, let the robots do it. Yeah. Do it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how how drones are, are changing what you do? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first and foremost, it's about just getting this understanding of the blade surface in, in a really good level of detail. Um, so Power Curve, we, we've been working with Skyspecs, for example, for, for a little while, looking at how can we use this incredible data set that's being captured uh, with all the, the high resolution images to drive a turbine-specific performance calculation. So I talked about, you know, as making this kind of, uh, you know, engineering desk study about what's the blade condition how does that affect performance and, and running the model as well? I can see in the not too distant future uh, us being able to take the drone inspection data, that being categorized uh, you know, with a piece of AI software that categorizes it aerodynamically in terms of severity. And then that goes straight in to a performance calculation based on that turbine specific image set. So what you could get is for every time you fly a drone around a turbine or every different turbine, you get a new AEP calculation done for that turbine with that data set. And that, that suddenly becomes really exciting because you can monitor things, you can track them every time you do a flyby, basically. And, and the cost of these drone inspections is, is getting lower all the time as well. So linking this data set into a calculation engine that delivers a turbine specific AP result is something that we're actively working on now and, and hopefully we can we can share more with with the industry later later this year. So the, the drone data is becoming more ubiquitous. 
And it's just there's just so much data on so many turbines and so many blades at this point. How do you do you try to group them together in terms of like where the turbines are located in terms of the types of damage they're, they're seeing and, and what the the aerodynamic upgrades would be? Is it is it location specific? Is it manufacturer specific? How do you how do you sort of group that in your head? Probably first and foremost, it's going to be location. I would say so. Um, rainfall plays you know a big role um, because rainfall is what drives erosion. It's those those raindrops being hit by the leading edge at like you know 150 miles an hour they're like little bullets right so the amount of rainfall in a year uh, is a big driver of erosion but then also just the other atmospheric contaminants and things so that's obviously a very climate specific very location specific um we then maybe on a level down you'll think about you know individual manufacturers so some manufacturers use off-the-shelf aerofoils, some use custom aerofoils, and, and they perform differently mm. when they're contaminated or eroded. So we have in our heads some particular blades that we know don't like erosion, and we have in our heads some blades that, you know, although they don't like erosion, it's not to the same penalty level as, as this other this other manufacturer. So, sure. Yeah, the, that's something we keep in our in our head as like our initial assessment. So if I'm an operator in the northern lattice spheres of the United States where it rains a lot, say Seattle and Bjorn Hedges, our friend yeah. Bjorn Hedges out in out in the West Coast, where there's a lot of rain all the time, there's a a, a direct correlation. Like you know that part of the world is going to be erosion, and it's that that's a slam dunk in terms of aerodynamic upgrades could eliminate a lot of issues in those wetter areas. Yeah, it's it's pretty likely. I mean, unfortunately, um, like the quality of the leading edge, you know, the surface protection has, you know, that that's going to skew your results somewhat. So you know, you might have this really nicely made leading edge with good protection mm -hmm. that's sat next to a turbine that doesn't and they experience the same rain and you know one erodes one doesn't so again we have to think in generalizations and rules of thumb but there's always quite a lot of exceptions to the rule because effectively the leading edge is a handmade product you know yeah. so it's got that that human variability in surface quality and, and, and craftsmanship and also different materials some blades have LEP, others don't so but we can yeah we can take some guidelines some some generalizations but that's why it's nice to have the drain data because you don't have to guess you just look <laughs> yeah and the difference between offshore turbines and onshore turbines in terms of the aerodynamic upgrades are they essentially the same sort of upgrades yeah fundamentally so we would apply uh, or look to apply a full menu of uh, VGs gurney flap serrations whether the turbine is on or offshore. Um, Again, generalizing a little bit, offshore turbines will often see more erosion than onshore because of this uh, this mm -hmm. highly uh, salty environment, you know, more rainfall, higher wind speeds, all, all this kind of stuff. Um, and on the flip side, when we think about serrations, they're maybe not as relevant offshore sure. because, you know, who, who's going to hear them? Right. So. Yeah. Shar sharks are not bothered by by the swooshing <laughs> noise. No, no, well not, not in the ones I've interviewed anyway. No. <laughs> yeah, Shark Week. Come on, yeah. come on. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, onshore and offshore, fundamentally, you know, the aerodynamic issues are the same, but you may have yeah, maybe some slightly more severe erosion on average when you go offshore. Are you getting more data, drone data? from offshore because the risks are so much higher and the, the cost associated with damage is so much higher to repair. Is there just more data coming offshore right now than onshore? Or wh where's the data coming from today? I would say still the the dominant data was onshore, but that's, that's more just because there are so many more turbines onshore. But in terms of the, the motivation for drone inspection, I'd say that's definitely being really driven by, by offshore, you know? Mm. So, Safety is just so critical, and you know I, I live in the UK. The North Sea is not a nice place to be much of the year. <laughs> you, you don't want to be on a boat. You don't want to be hanging from a rope if if you don't need to. So, I think the offshore industry is really going to push the robotics, not uh, just in terms of inspection, but in terms of maintenance as well and, and repair. I think they're really going to take the lead there because it's just yeah, this really safety critical and, and cost critical environment. Yeah, well, it's good you, you you brought that up. You're uh, you're just 
you're helping me with my segues so much here. <laughs> um, speaking of, of tech and and keeping workers safe and all this, what are some of the, your predictions for uh, the future of wind power and, and technology? Well, I think um, yeah, the drone conversation we've just had that's that's super relevant mm-hmm. for this future. Um, it's about getting good data and 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 making things safer. I, I don't see turbines getting any smaller. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it's a bit of a running joke in the industry, really, where someone makes a prediction about a big rotor, only to have that prediction proved wrong a few years later. Sure. So, you know, I used to work at Vestas and people were like, ah, oh, can we really transport a 50 meter blade? Is that, can we really do that? And then now people are doing a hundred meter blade, you know? Yeah. So I th- yeah, they're going to get bigger, um, but onshore, my feeling is, again, at the risk of sounding silly in five years, <laughs> we're sort of getting to the limit of onshore sizes. Not because we can't do it, but it's just such a big structure to, to have on land. Whereas on, mm-hmm. on on offshore, build them on the dock, send them straight out to sea, it's much, it's much easier. So yeah, size. Uh, and then I think smart control, utilizing these new data sources. So... As turbines get bigger, what's a really interesting problem is the fact that you have such a varying load distribution over this rotor. You know, these things are 200 meter diameter offshore. You can imagine the wind speed at the top of the rotor is very, very different from from the wind speed at the bottom and from side to side. So how do you deal with that? And I think the advent of more smart sensors uh, such as fiber optics, for example, they're going to allow you to measure a lot more in real time. So you can imagine a blade that's fully tricked out with loads of sensors. It can measure where the blade's position is. Maybe you've got a LIDAR on top of the cell. It can actually see what wind is coming to the turbine. And you could use these two data sources together to basically get the turbine to react um, in advance of, of some of this uh, this gust coming in, for example. So I just think sensors are going to play a really huge role like they are in a, in a lot of um, technology You know, right now. Cost is plummeting, capability is rising. So it's just about integrating it into this um, this turbine platform. You know, right. Where is my blade? What's, what's it doing? How can I monitor its health? How can I pitch it so that the loads stay within a certain level? And it's all about just driving down the cost of energy, um, reducing maintenance, these kind of things. Sure, we finally reached that technology edge, and the size of the turbines have gotten so big, and the cost of turbines along with it, that mm. these instrumentation systems, relatively speaking, in terms of cost, are inconsequential. But, like you yeah. said, they can really extend the life. They will extend the lifetime of blades and the whole structure considerably. As soon as you essentially have active pitch systems that are smart and and you have lidar on top of it boy that that just yeah. extends everything out in terms of lifetime because it reduces those extreme events significantly it's a huge change it's going to happen yeah i just think you you know using this data is a big challenge like big data is such a buzzword but right. <laughs> you know that that's a that's a problem because so many companies OEMs they have huge amounts of data and they don't use it today. You know, like, no. you know, they might have 50 sensors on a turbine. Are they actually using that data? I would bet that quite a lot of them aren't. Again, there's leaders in the field, some sure. of the, the operators, super smart. But again, it's just about bringing up the level in the industry of using data in a smart way. Like, can I predict a gearbox failure before it happens? Can I pitch a blade before, you know, a gust hits it? All these kind of things are... Are going to get more important as you know you want to really try to squeeze every last drop of energy and cost out the system well nick this is a great conversation and uh you know we really appreciate you coming on the show to to give us a glimpse into what what power curve is doing can you give us uh some ways for our, our listeners and our viewers here on youtube to follow up with you and with the company and obviously for those of you listening we'll put links in the show notes and the description in youtube so you can easily click through to uh, to learn more about Power Curve and about uh, Nicholas here. But can you point us in the right direction? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we we have a, a website um, that we'll get the link up for powercurve.dk. Uh, there's there's a contact uh, form on there that you can reach out. 
Uh, you can find uh, me on LinkedIn as well. Very happy to accept uh, messages, invitations through LinkedIn for you to um, for you to make contact. And then, you know, like I say, it's all about this very personalised discussion. You know, what is what turbine have you got? What problem might you have? And, and how do we fix it? So, you're not going to get a generic sales brochure. Um, you're going to talk to one of our team personally, and we're going to make sure that we we give you exactly what's what's best for your wind farm like i say we don't just have this one product we're gonna we're gonna ship you we're going to to make sure we optimize it for your needs yeah that's awesome well nick thanks so much for coming on the show we really appreciate it. it's great catching up with you yeah absolute pleasure and you know thanks thanks for the great questions great great conversation and um yeah maybe we can do it again sometime absolutely all right well we're going to wrap up today's episode of uptime if you're new to the show welcome if you're a regular here thank you for your continued support Please subscribe to the show and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to check out the WeatherGuard Lightning Tech YouTube channel for video episodes, full interviews, and short clips from each show. For Alan and all of us at WeatherGuard, stay safe and we'll see you next week. Is downtime causing you financial pain and putting a stop to your power production for months on end? It's no secret, lightning strike damage is a major cause of wind turbine downtime. This damage is preventable with our easy to install strike tape lightning protection system for wind turbine blades. Our incredible engineering, build quality, materials, and edge sealants withstand up to five times more abuse in the toughest weather and lightning conditions. And we've got the research to prove it. If you're tired of constant downtime, we can help. Reach out to us at weatherguardwind.com and schedule a free call. We'll get your uptime back in no time.